Hi, this is Long. Welcome to our video series on search patterns for the most common studies in radiology. Please note that this is an introduction to study interpretation. An enormous amount of detail is omitted for brevity. Continue dedicated reading, seeing as many cases as possible, and keep getting feedback from subspecialists during the course of your training. Okay guys, so today we're gonna to talk about a basic approach to MRI of the shoulder. So on this sort of study, uh, kind of an additional caveat applies that this is gonna be kind of a very introductory talk and um, kind of covering just the basic anatomy and things you wanna think about. Um, and the organization of such an approach is kind of dependent on your uh, specific preference. Um, and I would advise you to look for more advanced resources beyond the kind of very basic uh, topics covered in this video. So MRI of the shoulder is generally used to evaluate for rotor, rotator cuff injuries and numerous other soft tissue and osseous pathologies that can affect the joint. It can be particularly helpful to when getting oriented and getting started to hang the sagittals together, so the coronals together, um, and same with the axials. And that can, ca can help you correlate uh, the anatomy across various projections, various sequences. Um, the, uh, it, it's important when looking at basically any sort of MRI of, of a joint to remember that there's a whole bunch of differing tissues, including the muscular, subcutaneous, uh, osseous, or marrow uh, structures. Um, and, and that, you know, it, explanatory pathology can be present in any of these. Oftentimes, the um, most kind of worrisome pathology in, impacts the marrow, such as infection, neoplasia, or, you know, fracture going through the cortex and also kind of with um, abnormalities also seen in the marrow space. So those that's kind of the area where you want to be particularly careful, and that sometimes I will double check um, looking at those. Okay, so let's take a quick look at an overall structural organization of how we would approach an MRI shoulder. So as with any sort of study, you want to understand the patient history, indication, what they're coming in for, um, and any sort of prior studies, radiographic, uh, MRI, even CT of this area, um, and, and you know, and, and in some cases, incidentally imaged on other kind of non-MSK imaging. Well, uh, kind of as part of due diligence, make sure that we at least get a glance at all the anatomy that is outside of the joint, outside of the osseous structures, um, uh, that we image incidentally on the localizers, on the various cross-sectional images, and going through bit by bit, we'll assess the bone uh, and associated marrow spaces, take a quick look at all the tendons, um, uh, and look at the you know the various joints, glenohumeral, acromioclavicular, look at the ligaments around the shoulder, and then make sure we look at the remaining tissues, muscular, subcutaneous, and let's keep in mind also that there are um, kind of neurovascular structures and the incidentally imaged kind of chest wall that we, we see here, and just to make sure that we at least glance at those. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so here is uh, kind of our institutional protocol for non-contrast MRI shoulder. Um, we have here axial PD. We have um, sagittal through the humeral head and the, uh, the uh, glenohumeral articulation, um, T1 pre-contrast, and then a uh, T2 fat sat, you know, kind of a fluid sensitive sequence. And we have oblique coronals also through the glenohumeral articulation, pre-contrast T1, and then a fluid, another fluid sensitive kind of corresponding here and here, uh, T2 fat sat. Okay. Um, then we have localizers here. And as, as usual, once you understand the patient and, and what's going on, potential, um, you know, known pathology or suspicion for, it's always good practice just in general to make sure that we're kind of looking at everything else outside of uh, the shoulder, outside of the anatomy that we're expecting to see on the other sequences on the localizers, okay? Um, so just uh, making sure that we do that as a step. And then kind of... Um, one potential approach is to is to start with the marrow spaces and the bone cortex, and as we go through each of the sequences and make sure that we look at all of the cortices, um, looking for breaks, fractures, deformities. In particular, you know, uh, you know, a common thing that's going to be affected is looking for sequelae of, you know, prior impaction or dislocation injury, um, hill sacks. Um, uh, at the humerus and you know other sort of impaction injuries. We're looking for osteophytes um, and abnormal bone signal that may be associated with like loose bodies or old fracture fragments surrounding the joint space. Um, heterotopic ossification. Um, 
as we're looking particularly on the T1 pre-contrast, we're looking at the marrow signal, um, comparing it to muscle, and looking to see if there's any sort of marrow uh, replacement. Um, you know, infection, neoplasia are two sorts of processes that are going to impact the marrow signal that are going to be particularly important to make sure that we detect. Um, you know, in, in, in some cases, you're going to see uh, distributions of hematopoietic marrow that is not necessarily expected for a patient's age or their um, kind of known medical conditions, and that can be a thing that will tip you off to other kind of systemic or underlying processes. Um, and we do have to note that at least, you know, a marrow signal kind of best seen on the, you know, uh, or at least for any replacement on the pre-contrast T1s, we also see some, you know, edema on our um, fluid-sensitive sequences. We have to just also note that you are going to see some extent sometimes of the chest wall, some of the ribs, and so that, and sometimes you'll see um, something incidental there as well. It's kind of a good practice to at least take a quick look um, um, and see if there's any sort of abnormal fluid collections. Um, we'll be looking at, you know, in, in the region, getting a sense as to whether there's anything in the, in the joint space or in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. Um, if, you know, there has been kind of like an orthographic study performed, this would be a good time to at least also look for, uh, you know, abnormal communication between these sites, okay? Um, you know, it can be, uh, you, you can kind of do this at this point or kind of later with the glenohumeral articulation, but we can take a look right now at the acromial clavicular articulation, which can be seen well, the axials, and then, and then in different projections on our um, uh, sagittals and coronals, and getting a sense as to whether there's osteophytes, anatomic variation, um, such as like an osochromiali, which you can see well on the, uh, on the axials, or if there's like a spur, which you can kind of get a sense of scrolling back and forth through the kind of oblique coronals that we get. Um, and it'll be good, and you know, especially if there's abnormality there, we're moving on and taking a look at the various tendons surrounding the, the uh, shoulder. Um, we're going to do a rotator cuff and kind of the, one of the most, you know, the, the good one to start with, um, particularly because where most of pathology you'll see are kind of like the earliest involvement is going to be the supraspinatus we're seeing here. Um, and then across its various projections, we um, see it well on the coronal and sagittal fluid sensitive sequences, let me kind of zoom in here, you see it coming over the top. So correlating across the coronal and sagittal fluid se uh, sensitive sequences can be particularly useful as we follow the tendon um, you know, along its entire course. And we're looking for abnormal fluid signal, uh, you know, such as traversing the tendon, indicating a, you know, a full, or you know, it could be also a um, uh, partial thickness tear. Partial thickness may be on the bursal side, on the uh, articular surface, or maybe intersubstance, like right in the middle, like interstitial. Um, we want to kind of correlate any findings here with abnormal fluid in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa and look for, um, you know, if there is kind of a complete tear, so like discontinuity of the tendon, um, we're going we're gonna to look for any retraction. Um, you know, which can be seen well on the uh, oblique, oblique coronals that we'll have. Um, if there's intermediate fluid signal and thickening, you might want to think, you know, thinking about uh, tendinosis and, you know, other sort of signal abnormalities inside the substance of the tendon um, can in some cases such a, uh, you know, indicate like such as with low signal, like a high like a depositional process, like hydroxyapatite depositional disease. Um, and then we're going to go through and kind of, you know, I think the, the super, the super spinatus is kind of a good place to start as much things, many things um, will impact that first. And then we're going to go through the, the remaining tendons um, and take a look, you know, at our uh, infraspinatus, teres minor, uh, and subscapularis. Okay. We're going to do that both, you know, on the um, sagittals and then uh, correlating with our other sequences um, to kind of get a sense of that overall anatomy. All right, and then once we've taken a look at all of those, um, the kind of the last last bit is to make sure that we take a look at the biceps tendon as it as it courses through, you know, adjacent here um, to the humerus into the bicepital groove, and then watching it as it goes into the um, uh, intraarticular course. Subluxation uh, will imply like a subscapularis tear um, that kind of courses over the bicepal group here. Um, and make sure that, that the, this, the, the, the biceps tendon we're seeing is of normal size um, and signal. Um, and, and, you know, in addition to its position being expected here, and we can kind of correlate here 
between the axials and the various other projections to help make sure that we're seeing it um, seeing it well and uh, understanding where it is relative to other structures. And once we've taken a look at the various tendons surrounding the shoulder, we can move on and take a look at the glenohumeral joint. Uh, we're we're going to ask, is there good alignment? Um, is there displacement, uh, such as, like, say, um, a high riding or superior displacement, as we often see in chronic rotator cuff tears? Um, if there's kind of inferior displacement, um, is, there, is it being pushed by an effusion? Is there atrophy associated of the musculature? Um, and then we'll, we'll note now if there's any, again, uh, if we hadn't already seen, if there's fluid in the joint space, uh, like a joint infusion. Um, if, if, if we're, you know, taking a look at the, um, you know, at, at the joint, we're looking uh, surrounding the joint at the uh, inferior glenohumeral ligament, uh, abnormal thickening and in, uh, intermediate signal, which we can kind of see on uh, the coronal image as well, um, as, you know, can be seen in the setting of synovitis, uh, a loss of you know, fat signal and a damage change uh, in the um, ro rotator, you know, uh, loss of fat signal basically in the, um, on our pre-contrast T1s um, or a damage change at the rotator uh, cuff interval can be seen with, say, uh, adhesive capsulitis is, is the thing that could come to mind for that. As we look um, kind of further and you want to take a look at the labrum, which is kind of best seen correlating, you know, such as using the, um, you know, kind of like the sagittals here as like a map, and you can kind of then use um, our axials and, 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 and coronals to kind of look at the full, fullness of its extent. Um, we're going to look at a, uh, for tears at the superior labrum, so just like a slap tear, and then, you know, um, and, and make, seeing if it extends, um, to, you know, involves the origin of the long hair of the biceps, um, and it extends as, as a slap tear, okay? Things you want to keep in mind, especially assessing the antero superior labrum, are variations in, you know, uh, in like say the middle glenohumeral ligaments. There's a Buford complex or sublabral uh, recess. We want to differentiate these from avulsion injuries. Um, you know, isolated anterior superior labral tears are, are generally very, very rare, and um, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing involvement of the rest of the labrum if we're kind of concerned for something like that. Um, as we're kind of looking through and correlating across the sequences, we're, we're, we're looking at the anterior inferior aspect, particularly for, like, bank heart lesions, um, and then uh, looking at, you know, irregularity for tear, for avulsions, um, see if there's any uh, detachment of the labrum, um, you know, and, and kind of differentiating that from anatomic variants. Um, we're going to also look at the posterior labrum as there can be a similar spectrum of injuries as we see um, from, at, you know, at the anterior aspect of the labrum. Um, that can often be seen well on, on the axials. Um, as, we, as, as we finish looking at uh, the, the labrum, um, you know, and if we, uh, oh, I should mention, if we do see a lesion, we want to kind of correlate between the humerus uh, and the glenoid and see if there's kind of like a reciprocal lesion, okay? Um, and then as we, uh, you know, finish looking, uh, uh, kind of like one of the last points of looking at the joint spaces to make sure that we get a good look at the cartilage um, using the, you know, axials. And if we have coronal PD or, uh, and, you know, we can also use coronal, um, like fluid, sequ uh, fluid sensitive sequences. And we want to get a good look at, you know, separately, the glenoid and the humerus, looking for subchondral marrow cystic change, edema, um, uh, and, and, and especially if you're seeing abnormalities uh, at the kind of subchondral marrow space, so that can kind of clue you in to more subtle uh, cartilage loss. Um, all right. And, and, and if you do have orthographic images, this is kind of a good time to, uh, to kind of key in on the, uh, into the, any cartilage abnormalities. We can um, then take a look at a couple of the ligaments that uh, are surround the, the uh, shoulder. We have the uh, coroclavicular ligaments, and, we, and then you can also take a look at the acromioclavicular. Let's see if we go all the way up here, which we will also be able to see on multiple other projections, and we're looking for discontinuity, abnormal, you know, uh, size of the interval surrounding edema that would indicate any sort of underlying abnormality there. And then as we wrap up, we would just want to make sure that we're thinking about all the other um, kind of tissues that surround the osseous, ligamentous, um, tendinous structures uh, of the shoulder. So we're, we're, we've got to make sure that we're, we're thinking about um, the musculature, and you can kind of take a, you can, you can look for the size of the musculature on the T, um, pre, you know, the, the, the non-contrast T1s, um, 
uh, as well as, you know, if any edema on our kind of fluid sensitive sequences, um, you know, or this can also key us off into the uncommon sort of mass lesions or anything like that. We're looking for, you know, atrophy, we're looking for edema, inflammation, or anything like that. So one good uh, rule of thumb is that when we're looking kind of on our oblique sagittals um, is to see if the supraspinatus is below the level of, of the um, scapular spine. If that, that, if that can indicate or give you a good uh, indication if there is atrophy of the muscle in terms of muscle bulk. And we should remember at least... Um, you know, uh, it would uh, even though if we're partially imaging that there's neurovascular structures here, so like the brachial plexus and you know, and the kind of subclavian vessels that will kind of course through here um, in 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 the shoulder, kind of like kind of uh, in terms of other anatomy and it's in uh, things that will impact that will will have kind of subsequent denervation issues in the uh, related upper extremity. So this can kind of like the neurovascular structures sometimes you can see well um, as they course through kind of like um, in, uh, through fat um, on our T1 uh, weighted sequences. And, you know, I know that we had talked about it previously uh, when going through the localized, but just to remember us, final check that we're not missing any sort of things that are in the incidental surrounding anatomy, okay? That's kind of a last check. Um, and then, um, you know, any sort of abnormality that we're finding, we want to make sure that we're correlating um, uh, uh, across the various kind of subsets of anatomy to see if there is marrow signal abnormality, uh, muscle signal abnormality, subcutaneous abnormality that correlates with the various uh, things that we're seeing. Um, as we're following the neurovascular structures, it, uh, it can be good to recall um, or to keep in mind if we're seeing mass or cystic lesions along the course of the brachial plexus, you know, in the region of the uh, suprascapular notch, in the region of the spinal glenoid notch uh, posteriorly, um, it, wh where we expect the quadrilateral space. Uh, these sorts of, you know, uh, impingement at these areas can produce denervation changes. Um, uh, and kind of in associated musculature and you know and then kind of finally um, we just want to you know I know we had talked about this previously when looking at the uh, localized but to just make sure that we are not kind of missing anything on the various edges of the study uh, whether in the chest wall or in the kind of chest viscera okay and so as a final recap, just to go through the overall structure that we talked about in terms of a you know, very basic approach to an MRI shoulder is, is, as always, we're trying to get a sense of everything that's going on with the patient. And then we're going to keep in mind that we see some other sort of anatomy and, and just as you want to take a brief check as to looking at that as well as we're looking at the kind of uh, you know, joint and associated structures of interest. Um, look at the bone, marrow signal uh, for breaks, fractures, deformities, and then we're going to look for throughout the tendinous structures, the, the, uh, you know, the glenohumeral articulation, the, uh, the AC joint, the various ligaments, um, you know, the, we're looking for fluid signal, ab abnormal kind of uh, signal and thickening across these various structures. Um, and then finally, making sure that we, we take a look at the subcutaneous tissues, the musculature, you know, uh, the neurovascular uh, structures and kind of key anatomical points of potential impingement as they course through um, and kind of trying to put this all together to explain what's going on with the patient.